See that log over there? Take a closer look. There might be some good stuff tucked in there. I had a hell of a time with my adventure through the Sierra Madre, but it's safe to say the Dead Money DLC wasn't for everyone. It's got a cult following now, like all the DLC, but at the time of release, reception wasn't great. Probably a case of radio killing the video game star. In lieu of Dead Money's experimental riff on survival horror, with gameplay changes that I liked, but that rubbed others the wrong way, Honest Hearts is much more of a back-to-basics expansion pack. Here's an extension to the map, new quests, a new idol animation that you can tell they're tremendously proud of, and the exploration of a pivotal lore character we've yet to meet. Time to join up with the Happy Trails expedition and tackle a new frontier. Give me the collar, master. Oh shit, nope, nope, not that one. It is one thing to forgive a slap across my cheek, but an insult to the Lord requires... No, it demands correction. Honest Hearts doesn't drop you into the party quite as aggressively as its predecessor. Instead of a kidnapping followed by a massive info dump about all the new game mechanics, you just meet a bunch of gormless traders in a cave. Because really, there are no new game mechanics. These guys have their sights set on crossing through Zion National Park to establish a trade route, but if you want to join the team, you have to run on a limited inventory and you don't get to bring friends. It's a nice idea, but it really cripples your variety more than it does increase the challenge. Stim packs are weightless and ammo is too, unless you're playing on hardcore mode. So showing up in combat armor with a laser tommy gun, a plasma shotgun, and a gauss rifle will get you put on the no-fly list, but you can go on the nature hike with a single grenade machine gun, 7,000 grenades, and more healing items than there are atoms in the universe. And you might as well do with the stim packs, because I didn't find a one in Zion National Park. This DLC seems to be pursuing the frankly hopeless dream of giving somebody, anybody, a reason to level up the notorious dump stat survival. Stop trying to make survival happen. It's not going to happen. Maybe on New Vegas' release day, when stim packs were rare and pretty expensive in the early game, I could imagine there was some minor value in a cost-effective skill that let you use food as healing items. But with the release of Gunrunner's Arsenal, which is now included in every copy, New Vegas' economy sort of got fucked. It's fairly exploitable, even if you don't go the full Rain Man in the casinos. Even the medicine skill isn't that valuable at this point, outside of role-playing builds. Who the hell is gonna invest in a skill that heals you less than medicine, but also encumbers you more as you carry your trail mix around? And you can't even make the case for realism with survival. When I go for realism runs, I set realistic limits on what I would be able to carry, completely forgo healing items, and force myself to eat and rest daily as part of the roleplay. I don't chug 15 A and W's mid-combat to mend my broken leg and say, wow, this is more realistic than medicine doing that. Anyways, back to the new stuff. Once you've whittled down your loadout to get rid of the useless things like scrap metal, pre-war books, and arcade ganon, the caravan is off to the races, led by our good friend Jed Masterson, voiced by Dave Fenoy. You might not think you know who that is, but trust me, you probably know who that is. I don't want no whining about old Mr. Masterson. I left my one-of-a-kind plasma cannon back at base. Look, I just don't think I can do it. I'll hold the tourniquet or something. Are you fucking kidding me? Hey, Jed, I've got some bad news for you, bud. You're in a Bethesda game and you're played by a well-known actor. Your number's on the wall. Yeah, Patrick Stewart's Emperor Escape Tunnel didn't go so hot, did it? And Liam Neeson's Water Purifier just worked swimmingly the first time, right? So it isn't long before the Sword of Damocles comes down on the hapless trails caravan and you're left to explore the park by yourself. Oh, Jed, we hardly knew ye. I will remember you. It isn't long before you come across our first new companion, Follows Chalk, and in my case, I instantly smoked him because he looked just like another enemy. Mission failed, companion is kill, and I get to reload the DLC and lose Jed all over again. I will remember you. When the aliens arrive, don't put me in charge of first contact. Okay, let's try this again. Hello, Chalky. Take me to your leader, the man we're all here in this DLC to see. Joshua Graham, the burned man. You see, there once was a fellow named Graham, lost the battle for Hoover Dam, was Caesar's companion, was thrown off a canyon, and got roasted like Christmas ham. Caesar was none too pleased that his plan to make Joshua an extra crispy boy didn't manage to do the tough bastard in. So while in public, he declares that Joshua is totally, really 100% dead, in private, Caesar offers membership in his legion to the first tribe that's able to finish the job. Joshua, on the other hand, took his tumble as a second chance at life, a chance to redeem himself for letting his efforts to protect a wayward tribe spiral into the behemoth that is now known as the Legion. He's returning home to the kind-hearted people who raised him, the New Canaanites, at the same time recognizing that his very presence makes the New Canaanites a target for the Legion and its co-conspirators. The White Lakes tribe that took out our caravan are the very same tribe on the hunt for the flame-broiled Canaanite. 
The new Canaanites have two camps. There's Daniel, who doesn't mind protecting himself, but wants to preserve the innocence of those he protects by fleeing through the Grand Staircase to find a new home. Joshua isn't quite so merciful. He's like, listen, the White Legs are scum, Zion National Park is a gift from God and they don't deserve it, and after all the nice things the new Canaanites have done for me, it'd be rude to not knuckle down and use the skills I spent my time in Caesar's Legion working on. Those skills, of course, being tribal genocide. In the best of all possible worlds, they would just leave us in peace. But they won't. I don't enjoy killing, but when done righteously, it's just a chore, like any other. Joshua continues the DLC trend of constantly trying to one-up New Vegas' awesome voice actors, which ultimately reaches its apotheosis in the fourth DLC, where it becomes borderline self-parody. If you believe in something enough, you must be willing to let it burn. But we'll get to that in Lonesome Road. Now, when I say there are two camps in this DLC, that's a bit misleading. There's really just the two leaders, Joshua and Daniel, and you get their ethos straight from the horse's mouth. We never get a good sense of what the tribes they protect are thinking by interacting with them. They're sort of just along for the ride. It's fine. Joshua in particular manages to hold my attention pretty well, but when you don't see the inner workings of how the ideals of these factions play out in practice, you don't wind up with the same faction depth you get in the base game. Take the three main factions in New Vegas. Depending on what choices you make and what areas you stumble across initially, your first impressions may vary, and while each faction operates in a certain way and with a certain goal, seeing all the little stories that play out in the side quests will gradually inform your opinion on how each faction actually behaves. So you'll likely encounter the Legion at Nipton and witness their off-Broadway production of Jesus Christ Superstar, and you say to yourself, okay, no doubt, these are just the bad guys. I'd be lying if I said Caesar's Legion aren't obviously supposed to be the bad guys, but when and if you find yourself in conversation with Kaisar himself, and he talks you through the formation of the Legion, there's a certain logic to it. His esoteric thesis and antithesis premises for the universe are sort of like Austrian economics. They're walking you through it step by step, and you're like, okay, that makes sense, but then at the end you look back and realize the point you've arrived at is completely insane. Still, have to give kudos to a work of fiction that's daring enough to explore the potential societal benefits of fucking slavery. Apparently slavery was pretty awesome. Prove it. What's to prove? It's free labor. Not that ass! What? Most other games just throw cannibalism in as the end-all be-all, ooh, look how edgy we are, we'll push you to the point where you have to eat someone. Not New Vegas, baby, they're aiming higher than that. All this to say, even the bad guy faction wasn't just evil for evil's sake with no rhyme or reason. And Caesar's reasoning of recreating an ancient society that honored duty to your nation over all else, banking on the fact that the Roman Empire is such a distant memory that it's become more of an ideal, works as a fantastic contrast to the new California Republic, who are basically just LARPing as the United States because they want to get back to the status quo. When you first encounter the NCR, they seem comfortable, rational, but the more side quests you do, the more you realize how spread thin and desperate they are to maintain a way of life that went the way of the dodo. I would not answer to a board of directors or any other entity. Nothing to impede progress. If you want to see the fate of democracies, look out the windows. On first meeting, Mr. House definitely presents his case the best of the three. Alive before the war, he's been in stasis, not with a plan to save the world, but with a plan to use the economy of New Vegas to funnel money towards a space program. 100 years, and my colony ships will be heading for the stars to search for planets unpolluted by the wrath and folly of a bygone generation. So you may just go to work for Mr. House, but in addition to him simply demanding certain factions be wiped out as he doubts they will ever compromise with him, you also realize his plan may be untenable because every single ally he has is secretly working against him. That's the kind of depth I'm talking about. The kind that makes me annoyed anytime I see someone on the internet say some lazy piece of shit game that tries to cram a topical political narrative down your throat is in any way comparable to a game as nuanced and evergreen in its themes as New Vegas. It's all in the little interactions. Caesar might sell you on his hardcore vision of mankind's survival, but interrogating Silas reveals the wanted cruelty of his operatives. The NCR might be aimless and littered with red tape, but when it's time to bring peace to Prim, they could be your only option. And for all his resources and intel, Mr. House's tenuous allies prove that no amount of money and bargaining will prevent people from working toward their own interests and higher ideals. Including you, probably, because I bet half of you assholes thought you were too cool for any faction and sided with Yes Man. The Yes Man option was always something I've more admired Obsidian for putting in the game than actually liked on a thematic level, because it 
really undercuts the faction war. But hey, the option is there in the Honest Hearts DLC too. It is perfectly within your rights to run into Zion, pop Joshua and Daniel in the head, and then roll out before it's time for breakfast. Essential NPCs are a Bethesda trait. Let me loop this large tangent about the virtues of the main game back to my original point, which is that there really is no exploration of the people within the new Canaanites that side with either Daniel or Joshua. Even your two companions for the DLC have surprisingly little to say about where they land on either side. So instead, you basically get a spiel from Daniel, a few more memorable Nelson Van Alden spiels from Joshua, then you get to the final mission and just pick a lane. Doubly disappointing is that whichever side you pick, the other just rolls with it. There's no climactic ideological clash between the two leaders as the exodus or massacre is about to unfold. Joshua literally says nothing if you decide to flee Zion. He just shows up after the loading screen as your companion like, let's do this buddy. And Daniel gives you a wimpy little, no, don't genocide the inhabitants of the canyon. Well, okay, if you insist. If I'm gonna get him to betray every ideal he holds in his heart, at least make me pass a fucking speech check. At the end of the day, I really didn't wrestle with which side I'm gonna go with for more than a few seconds. Do I become a Nikki Haley level Zionist and side with Joshua, replicating the inciting incident that also started Caesar's Legion? You know, the one Caesar recounts where they goaded a tribe with a few rivals to slaughter their opponents outright instead of just tepidly skirmishing them? Or do we side with Daniel, flee up the grand staircase, leaving behind a tribe that, well, adversarial, was put between a rock and a hard place, scavenging and even allying with Caesar's Legion in a desperate bid to survive in the harsh but beautiful land they inherited, but don't really understand? Well, the choice is obvious. Sorry, Daniel, we're not picking up your option. And if there wasn't an achievement for siding with you, whoever would. So maybe you think my complaints about not having fleshed out factions is a bit too critical for a DLC campaign with limited resources. And to that, I'd say not only is the Joshua versus Daniel stuff the most compelling part of the DLC, it is basically the only reason to play the DLC. So it needed more. The overworld is unique and beautiful by New Vegas standards, but the interiors are copy-pasted assets from as far back as Fallout 3. The new weapons are absolutely nothing to write home about, the enemies are all reskins, and worst of all, the quests are frankly embarrassing. If you want a super in-depth dive on what made New Vegas' quests such an immersive role-playing opportunity, check out Mark Brown's walkthrough of the many solutions and outcomes of the base game quest Beyond the Beef. But if you don't want to hear a British accent, listen to me use another DLC for an example instead dead money. You have to choose which companion to bring with you. You have to choose how you're going to get them to come along, how to get them to cooperate. You might not even have the skills or the resources to convince them to aid you in the heist willingly, and you'll just have to betray them. Then at the end of the campaign, all your interactions, all your missteps, all your times you used barter to bully Dean into doing your bidding could come back to bite you. You stepped into your character build, and it either made you or broke you the entire journey. What do you do in Honest Hearts? Pick up three pieces of equipment scattered around the overworld, destroy three enemy encampments around the overworld, then do the final escape or genocide mission. These quests are so filler that the NPCs don't even tell you each specific item or camp you're going to as far as I remember. They just say they need help, then the objectives pop up on your map. There's very little opportunity to use your skills. Even when you can, it's just to save you the time of unlocking a door or searching a room, and never impacts the outcome of the story. There's a bit more decision making in the side quests, but it's hardly a motive to go out of your way and play this DLC. The base game is bursting, overflowing with quests more interesting than these. I've played hundreds of hours of New Vegas and there's still quests I've never stumbled upon. I've never found the help the hookers escape the Gamora quest, for instance, but I know it's out there. I mean, hell, Honest Hearts even manages to screw up a drug trip mission. How hard is it to screw up a vision quest? You're given carte blanche with any of the bizarre visuals and themes of the Fallout universe, and all you can come up with is a camera filter and a bear that's on fire? Just look at the drug trip in Point Lookout, another fairly underwhelming DLC from Fallout 3. Now that was actually a trip. And to top off all the problems with the quests, they're easy. Aside from the occasional random giant gecko spawn that would mop the floor with me, I was able to make short work of the wildlife and the white legs. <laughs> So maybe it's best to tackle this DLC early, like early, early, right when it's first accessible, right outside Freeside before you cross the Rubicon into New Vegas proper. Because once you're actually in New Vegas, the intrigue and challenge of the quests is going to far surpass what's on offer in Honest Hearts. I'll let him die on his feet. Yeah, sure, my little graham cracker. We don't even need to execute the final boss. Just untie him and I'll kill him in combat. It'll be easy as shit. 
Oh my god, he killed me. That's fucking embarrassing. So I wound up pretty down on Honest Hearts at the end of the day, but I'm calling it like I see it. I don't think the risk-averse approach they went with after the minor backlash to Dead Money's more experimental aspects made Honest Hearts stand out in any way. So, in conclusion, if you like a gorgeous yet samey overworld, can tolerate back-to-back -back generic base-clearing missions, all with a story that's being held together by a tremendously charismatic and memorable character, then I would absolutely recommend Far Cry 3. If I'm gonna get him to betray every ideal he holds in his heart, at least make me pass a fucking speech check. God, can I not speak today? I can't pass my own speech check.